So th the ways in which you're a bit more left than others, what, mm. would that be on economics? On no, it's more, it's more in terms of social policy, in social terms, point, of, yeah. in terms of uh, the state having a role in things like education and health and making sure we have a decent welfare system. And I've always been a bit wary about some of the, you know, the, the sort of the hardline cutbacks that people sure. argue for. I'm much more to the right side of the spectrum when it comes to things like low taxes, open economies, global, okay. global connections, etc. Actually, can you tell us about your education policy? Because I seem to remember the last election, it did seem quite left-wing. Well, I'm not sure which element you're referring to in the particular. Tertiary fees. Sorry. Well, yeah, oh, sorry, oh, the tertiary fees. The tertiary fees, yeah. Well, well, lots of students here, yeah, they want okay. to know. Well, what very, very simple. Um, and it's reinforced by the fact that for the last three years as Minister of Revenue, I've had responsibility for collecting student loans and debts. And that's a bit of an uphill battle. Um, and it strikes me that, that, that the fundamental issue is when you talk about getting the student debt profile down, mm. and I won't go into detail about where that occurs, but the fundamental issue is what's causing it in the first place. Sure. Uh, and it seems to me that the problem we've got at the moment is students can borrow for their fees, borrow for their living costs, some are eligible for student allowances, and the whole mis sort of mismatch creates a system which ends up with a significant number of people having very substantial debt at the end, leaving New Zealand mm. the benefit sure. of their education being lossless. So uh, while we can do more to you know, get people to repay early, our view is, uh, United Futures view is very simple. If you, if you abolished student allowances but used that money to pay student fees, there'd be a modest top up, not a huge top up required from central government, there'd be a reduction in the level of borrowing. You could actually get away with having no tertiary fees and tertiary fees account for about 60% of student borrowings. So you then say to students, you can borrow for your living costs at around 170 bucks a week for mm. the time of the academic year. Well, that's we're, we're simply taking the we're not look. I think the implication in your question that a totally free system be put in place. We've never had a totally free system ever, and I think it's fanciful to suggest that in today's environment we can. We've got to have a situation where where students have to make some contribution towards it. What I'm saying is if you have a system that says you can borrow for your living costs, you would reduce student debt significantly. For a first degree, student debt would come down to a maximum, assuming someone borrowed the full amount for the full time, of around $20,000. For a degree like medicine, that debt would come down to around $40,000. Net consequence would be, firstly, less indebtedness per head, Secondly, less incentive for people to flee the country to earn big money but to pay off their, their student loans, never to come back to New Zealand. I think that's the benefit of so, the system, and so it also you, is fairer all around. If United Future got its way, what would fees be next year or the year after? Oh, what sort of level, level are we looking at? We'd, we'd keep them around the same level as they are now. Right. But at the last election, it was for free fees, wasn't it? Or well, I'm sorry, the, 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 the student... Um, the student allowance abolition would, would bridge the gap. Sure. That's, that's on the assumption that fees are at around their current level. Okay, sure. So we wouldn't be setting fees per se, the institutions would be, but within the framework of this was the maximum funding okay. available. So in what other areas do you think you differ from Labour and National at this coming election? Oh, I think to... there, are, there are a number of other areas. For instance, the student loan one is a vastly uh, significant one that, mm. that no other party has a policy mm. in that direction of. Uh, we want income sharing for families to be able to um, reduce their tax burden by up to $9,000 in certain circumstances. I think that's a considerable improvement on some of the complexities around the working for family system at the moment and would enable us to tidy up some aspects of that. Um, we've got a policy with regard to superannuation for, for older New Zealanders which is quite radical and that is that rather than get fixated on this debate about what's the retirement age, we actually haven't had a retirement age since 1993 by the way, um, we say that people should be able to take a reduced rate of national super from the age of 60. That's particularly important for Māori, for Pacifica, for people in the manual workforce who don't have long survival periods mm. post-retirement, um, or an, ex a, 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 an advanced rate if they defer take-up okay. to the age of 70. Bolster that with compulsory KiwiSaver. You'd actually get people making their own choice about their retirement age. We've had it actuarially costed, and it's virtually cost neutral. So it doesn't add to cost. It keeps the peg at about where it is at the moment. And I think it gives us a sustainable superannuation policy into the future. OK. So you, does it annoy you that 
some of the other parties aren't really talking about superannuation. I mean, National are pretty much trying to, you know, do their best so it's not on the well, agenda. Well, what, what annoys me is, is, is not so much that they're not talking about it, but when they do talk about it, they talk about it in very simplistic terms. Right. And like most politicians of my generation, I bear the scars of two decades of superannuation debates. You know, mm. the 1984 Labor government that we weren't going to touch the surcharge. Mm. And then we, we did, but it only affected one in four superannuitants. Right. And I can remember all those slogans. No one believed us. In 1990, National said, well, trust us, you know, we, we, we will abolish Labor's surcharge. It did and bought in its own. There's a whole decade, a uh, couple of decades of people having a complete lack of trust in politicians on superannuation. So I think it's very important to put the choice back to the people, which is what we've done. Okay. But the debate you hear from other parties, and from the ACT Party, uh, from elements in the National Party, and privately from people in the Labour Party, is we need to boost the age of entitlement up to 67 or higher. And I think all that does is set off that whole debate about can you trust politicians on super all over again. And in turn, what that does is not just disenfranchise those people who are close to getting superannuation, I'm talking about people in their sort of 60 plus bracket, let alone those already over the line, but a whole generation of people below that who come to the view, well, there's nothing there for me when I retire. And I think that's okay. been the tragedy of the sure. last 30 years in that debate. Okay, I just want to see if there's any questions from the audience or from the Twitter sphere. Ashley? Yeah, we've got a few questions mm. coming through from Twitter, actually. Um, the first one was, are you concerned about losing in Ohio? And if you were to, would you prefer if Shanks or Chauvel I'm not, oh. I'm not concerned about losing in Ohio, and um, in the unlikely event that that was ever a possibility, I think that the second part of the question highlights the dilemma of why I don't belong to either party. I cannot support either party. If I did, I'd have joined one. It's as simple as that. So you won't answer that part of the question, who you'd prefer to <laughs> Well, you? I don't prefer yeah. either. I, I, okay. I don't think Equally either of them much to offer. Okay, was there another question coming in? Um, yeah, are there any parties in Parliament that you would to work with? Uh, mm. In the current parliament, Good um, question. probably the Mana Party, um, but in the current parliament um, we have worked, or I have worked in this parliament and in previous parliaments on various issues uh, with every party. So yeah. does that mean you would refuse to go into any coalition that involved the Mana Party? Oh, uh, look, I, I think that's a hypothetical. I don't think anyone's going to bend over backwards to involve the Mana Party sure. in the governing arrangement. But people are quite interested in this issue yeah. of um, you know, what's going to happen post election. Yeah. Well, um, if, if Labor do somehow manage to get you know, a yeah. potential mm. a coalition together, mm. um, you know. Well, let me, let me say this um, the approach we've always taken to forming governing, governing arrangements has been to negotiate with the major party that's in, the, mm. in, the, in that position, uh, to negotiate an agreement with them. Um, which is a bilateral agreement. We have never negotiated multilaterally, you know, in other words, negotiated yeah, sure. with other small parties or, or said, well, let's the three okay. or four of us gang up together. So you're not but immediately the, rolling out. But at the same time, and... one of the things we've always said to the major party in negotiation, which is quite reasonable, we don't want to conclude A, B, C, and D with you mm. to, to find that you've done a deal with the next party, which rules out doing A, B, C, and D. And so in other words, the agreements have to be consistent. Okay. But you're not entirely ruling out being in a coalition with Labour, the Greens, New Zealand well, First, Mana. Um, I mean, it might be unlikely, <laughs> but... I think it's highly unlikely. Um, we spent six years working with Labour. Um, we worked constructively with them in that time. The last three years was Labour and New Zealand First. Mm. And uh, our but position has always been that we will vote with people when there are things we agree with them okay. on. But essentially, at the last election, you ruled out Labour, didn't you? I did, and the reason for that was... Uh, and it's still substantially the case, is that during our six years with them, we had achieved a lot of our policy objectives. Yes. And we had got to the point where it was clear that the next steps we might want to take were a step too far for them. And we were getting signals from the National Party okay. that they were, they were um, if you like, more in step with what we wanted. Okay, so is that still the case in 2011? Well, it is. I mean, I, I, so and there's some practical problems. I mean, the, National, the, the Labor Party wants to bring in a capital gains yeah. tax. I have spent my political career opposing capital gains taxes. Consistency, as I said before, is an issue for me. They want higher taxes. I've been the Minister of Revenue that's actually seen all our taxes come down in the last six years under both governments, okay. with the biggest drops being to the two bottom tax rates. Sure, but just for clarity, and I thought you were very yeah. clear back in 2008, yeah. is that the same position that you... I think that the next government will be national-led. My expectation is that's who we'd want to work with. 
Right, so not quite as clear. Well, it's, it's, yeah, it's, you keep it's, keeping the door open. No, I'm not. It. I'm not. I think I, I think it's pretty clear. Uh, I'm not expecting Labor to be in a position to form a government. Therefore, the question mm. of working with them, given the fact that there are policy differences, doesn't arise. So, what, what about the Greens? Because in the past, you've been pretty unkeen about well, working with yeah, there's them. A, there's a popular think... myth about that. I, I somehow, yeah. with three seats in 2005, yeah. prevented the Greens from getting into government. Right. I was in no position to prevent anyone from doing anything because our three seats in 2005 okay. weren't critical to the outcome. So, Having said that, mm. I worked very closely on a lot of issues mm. with Keith Locke. He's someone I'm going to miss mm. from Parliament. He's someone I regard as a friend. Um, we worked on a lot of foreign affairs issues together. We worked on issues relating to uh, a lot of things like, for instance, the removal of the law on sedition. Mm. Uh, we worked on things like changing some of the attitudes around birth, deaths and marriages legislation which would have prevented people getting access to historical data. So where we've had common cause, and mm. Keith was someone um, where I had common cause, I wouldn't say more often than not, but quite frequently with, sure. we worked very Well there was an element of liberal overlap there with some of his liberal um, yeah. principles as well. Yeah. And so and, uh, no problem in that score. Yeah. So, I'd, I still wonder whether you've, probably, you've become more comfortable with the Greens in recent years, because they have changed. Oh, look, um, we, we've all grown a little bit more mature, yeah, yeah. and, and um, I've said some things about the Greens in the past that I wouldn't say today. But we've all, we all you know, that's right. life. You, you learn from things that happen and you learn from your experiences. Okay, so the, the Greens, of course, have changed their coalition mm. policy, and they now have a, a policy of not being very favourable towards a uh, coalition with National, but not ruling it out, and they always have ruled mm. it in the past. So, I mean, what's your opinion? Well, Do you think I, I think what it comes down to what I said before, that if, if that situation yeah. arises, the yeah. Greens would negotiate oh, with National. Sure. Um, I guess I'm asked after not so much your uh, uh, what your int 